Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Nuggets News. Today we welcome a special guest, one of my investing heroes, and that's Roger Montgomery. So welcome to the channel, Roger. Great to be with you. I'm looking forward to discussing the investing world now that central banks have turned it upside down, a lot of people are sort of saying. So the first question I wanted to ask you was about debt. We often hear debt as this big, dirty word, but there's definitely types of good debt and types of bad debt. Yeah, so... When debt is used to finance things that go down in price, (laughs) it's bad debt. Um, When debt is used to fund uh, projects or asset purchases that produce an income that either now or in the future is going to exceed the cost of financing that debt, um, well, that's good debt. So in other words, if the cost of capital is less than the return on the capital, then you're adding value. So uh, you do that all day long, um, but there's a capacity restraint. You know, there's a capacity issue. So there's at a country level, at a you know, at a sovereign level, at a company level, and an individual level or a household level, there are capacity constraints. And when people exceed their capacity constraints, they get into a lot more trouble with debt than they would without the debt. Yeah, we're going to talk about property and the economy and the stock market and all that as well today, guys. But I think just some good examples. I think these days people are so obsessed with material objects and going into debt on your credit card to buy a fancy car is very different to borrowing some money to start a business, isn't it? Yeah, well, I mean, there there is a there is a risk in starting a business, but there is a, a there is a hundred percent chance of loss uh, with the car unless you're very very good at identifying cars that appreciate in price. And notice I say price and not value. Yeah. And when you're buying, when you're investing in things that don't produce an income, uh, then what you're doing is effectively speculating on somebody down the track wanting to pay more for that thing. So whether it's gold or cryptocurrencies or a collectible car or low digit number plate or art or wine, you know, they don't produce income. So the value is very much tied into the price that you can get. Um, if you have an asset that produces an income, the value is very different to the price. And what has your investing thesis, um, what, what is it these days, Roger? Very much value investors, is that right? Yeah, look, our, quite frankly, value investing has been you know, a really, really tough barrow to push um, because the optimists are winning, so to speak, and the optimists are those who believe that you know, with interest rates so low and quantitative easing having been in place now for almost a decade, um, what we've seen, in fact, it has been in place for a decade. What we've actually seen now is um, is the money, the money being very abundant and money being very cheap for a very long period of time. Consequently, people have migrated out of cash because cash has become a liability. So it wasn't that long ago that we had the recession that we had to have in Australia in the early 1990s, 1991. And, um, and the phrase back then was cash is king. I was at university or just graduated from university and I remember everyone said cash is king. And now cash is a liability. You don't want cash because it earns nothing. It earns 2.5% in Australia. It earns zero in the United States. Uh, and so it's not worth having. So people have looked to invest elsewhere and I use invest with uh, sort of inverted commas or quotation marks. And the reason why is because uh, you know the, people have speculated really, not invested. They've bought things that they... They bought anything that they thought would go up. And that's, as I mentioned earlier, art, wine, low-digit number plates, all the way up to high-yield re- high credit, what used to be called junk bonds, and even private equity. Uber exists only because people didn't want to have their money in the bank. Yeah. And they put their money in private equity funds, and those private equity funds then went and backed businesses. If I said to you, if I said to you uh, let's back this thing that might never make any money but we'll try and get out of it in 10 years' time and hopefully it'll be bigger and losing a lot more money in 10 years than it's earning today. There's no way you'd back that. I, you know, I, but it's dead. I think I read a stat the other day that the black, the blank check companies in America have never seen more funds, just investors saying, here, try and find me something to invest in. And it, it is just a crazy world. Uber's amazing. I mean, Uber doesn't make a, a dollar. It lost uh, $6 billion in the last two years, lost a billion dollars in the last quarter, it's raised $27.4 billion since it, it was in, incorporated in 2009. Um, it's in, that's how much has been invested in it. And as it gets bigger, it loses more money. You know, it's, it's extraordinary. It's, and people say, oh, it's going to be the next Amazon. Well, hang on a sec. It's raised 2,600% more money than Amazon before it IPO'd. And it's still not making any money. 
yeah, and it's a competitive space as well. It's not like other people haven't started yeah. Ubers. Exactly. And I, I got an email today, a fantastic email, amazing email today from Uber, saying that their Uber, their Uber Eats are launching a new product, a new service. It's where you pick up the food yourself from the restaurant. What is Uber that doesn't deliver? What is Uber Eats that doesn't deliver food? Isn't that called takeaway? You just go and pick it up from the restaurant? <laughs> I would have thought so, but I haven't read that oh, email. It's oh, just insane. It's... So they're going to lower and lower margin and more speculative ventures because the core operation hasn't made any money. And remember this, it doesn't make any money, which means its popularity is due primarily to the fact that it's been underpriced. They don't generate an economic return on the investment that they've made and they don't generate an economic return for owners, which means they're not charging enough. If they charged more, people wouldn't use them as much. They wouldn't be as popular as they are. Mm. In fact, the most popular trip around the world for Uber is the 2 a.m. trip home from the pub. Um, you know, a, a mum or a dad with three kids at the shopping centre and five bags of shopping, they're not going to pick up an Uber, just like they haven't picked up a cab. Cabs have been around for hundreds of years, and guess what? People still buy cars because they're more convenient. Yeah. Uber's not going to change that. We better move on because there's a lot to talk about today, but I do agree with you on all those points about Uber. One of the things you were alluding to, though, was these emergency measures, QE and low interest rates, and, and that has just opened the floodgates, as you say, for the availability of credit. And central banks promised us it would trickle down and, and stimulate the economy. But as you said, it's led to things like zombie companies, uh, money going into this junk debt. And now we see things like stock buybacks, central banks buying stocks. And in Japan, the, they own half the ETFs. And now they're talking about this being the new normal and it could spread to other places. So what do you think about all of that? Yeah, look, I don't think history uh, looks too kindly on these kinds of unconventional measures. Um, essentially, what history tells us is it just kicks the can down the road. This has been, you know, a fantastic financial experiment and it has kept us out of a depression. You know, had QE not occurred and zero interest rates not dropped to zero, or what's called ZERP in the United States, zero interest rate policy, had those things not happened, we would have had a depression uh, and it would have been a disaster. I don't know that we've escaped that yet. You know, I don't know that all we've done is just deferred a lot of pain. Um, and and what what... I think central banks realised is that the money uh, people weren't, you know, people would uh, people would end up using the money to speculate on real estate and invest in those things, and the wealth effect would ultimately allow people to feel more confident and start spending money again. Mm. What they would need to do now is defer the spending, defer the recession for long enough now to people for people to actually pay down that debt. So in the case of Australia, it's our household debt that's at record highs. In the US, it's corporate debt that's at record highs. So either corporates in the United States or households in Australia, they need to pay this debt down um, and we need to avoid a recession. Otherwise, central banks don't have the firepower to actually re-stimulate. Rates aren't high enough to allow them to cut as much as they have historically to stimulate the economy again. Yeah, so there's, there's four things that sort of worry me. And the first one is that central banks don't have the honesty to say what you've just said, that, hey, we this isn't worked out the way that we thought it would and we maybe have just deferred this. The second is that the, the wealthy have really benefited from all this as we see with asset prices going up and we see inequality growing and we start to see people like the yellow vest take to the street. And I actually think that it might be not be politically acceptable to do a QE4 or something similar in Australia. We might get a, a real surprise from the people rather than throwing eggs at the uh, politicians. But um, the, the final thing is the debt levels didn't go down at all. As you say, in a lot of places, they've, they've only just gone up and up. And so the solution is, or has been, to drop interest rates. And here we are at the zero bound. And the other day, the IMF blog put out a policy about how we can maintain deeply negative interest rates. And this just makes it even crazier. Yeah. So, so you know, the, the, the problem, the, the, the way to avoid a depression is to uh, provide people with more debt or more credit, extend credit. And the way to get out of that is to extend them more credit. You, know, you can't have 37 years of declining interest rates um, and you can't have 37 years of declining interest rates uh, leading to rising asset prices and that followed by, uh, sorry, declining interest rate. If, and then you can't have rising interest rates leading to rising asset prices. Yeah. So at some point down the track, if they're successful at stimulating the economy, 
rates have to go up. But then what happens is you end up with, you don't escape the business cycle, you don't escape the economic cycle, and you have higher interest rates, and that, so that has a negative effect on asset valuations. Um, and, and people migrate. When interest rates go up, people migrate out of the risky assets into the safer assets. And we saw that in October to December last year. Uh, bond rates started to climb. We saw, we saw the gap, the spread widen between corporate bonds and treasuries in the United States. And consequently, people said, hey, and the reason why that was the case, rather, is because people looked at treasury bonds and they said, you know what, they're actually starting to look more attractive. I'm lending my money to these companies that have no prospect of paying me back. I'm going to sell those bonds and buy treasuries because they're safer. And consequently, you saw the spread widen. And so returns dropped significantly from investing in high yield or junk bonds. Uh, and and, and that we'll see that again. You know, we'll see if, if rates, and this is why the central banks are caught between a rock and a hard place, because if they start to normalise interest rates, which they've been trying to do, then it either slows down the economy or people migrate into less risky assets, which results in the asset price actually falling. So one way or another, either asset values fall because rates go up or and or asset prices come down. So, you know, we've held a lot of cash in our funds. Um, it's really hurt our returns on our domestic funds. Our because there's more opportunities globally, our global funds are just hitting the lights out. You know, since inception numbers look absolutely fantastic. We're number one or two in Australia in terms of global funds available in Australia mm -hmm. since the inception of our funds. That's because there's more opportunities. But in Australia, there's not so many opportunities. And our tech stocks are even more expensive in Australia than the US counterparts. So we've held a lot of cash. We think that over the course of the next six to 12 months, there'll be opportunities to invest that cash in very attractive things. Yeah, so just expand on that further about being very frustrating because as you say, value investors look for certain metrics and a lot of um, even good investors now, Ray Dalio talks about, you've just got to almost throw everything you know out the window because as long as the Fed have the markets back, everything is just going to charge higher until they figure out you know, how else to get out of this mess. Yeah, so I've been in the markets long enough now um, to know that when you hear experts saying this time is different, um, it's, you know, you're really towards the end of the credit cycle, not at the beginning of the credit cycle. Yeah. So, you know, whether it's Ray Dalio or, you know, even Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett, yeah. you know, but Buffett's holding a record amount of cash in Berkshire Hathaway. Um, you know, his single largest position in the Berkshire Hathaway portfolio is cash. Uh, it's something like 27% of the market capitalization and more than 30% of the book value. Um, that's telling you when the... You know, the guy that has built the epochal fortune in investing is telling you that times are different, but we've got all this cash. Maybe times aren't so different. Yeah. Um, I think we'll see. You know, the, it's crazy. You know, there's, there's a company in Australia called Appen. Uh, Appen, you know, we think it's an interesting business. We don't think it's a particularly high-tech business. We think it's a, a labor arbitrage business. Um, very low-cost labor annotating data for artificial intelligence um, algorithms for Google and Facebook and so on not a particularly high-tech business. But it's trading at 36 times EV to EBITDA. You know, it's just insane. Um, a competitor called Lionbridge um, was bought only a couple of years ago by a private equity fund in the United States. Lionbridge is a US company, and it was bought by a US private equity company at eight times. Right? Now, it's going... That, that private equity business, US-based private equity business is taking that US-based uh, data annotation company and guess where it's going to list it? Not on the NASDAQ. It's going to list it here in Australia. Why do yeah. you think that? Well, we it's touched on this. In, yeah. Ridiculous prices for things. We touched it, on this in our documentary. There's just not enough places to park this money in Australia. And we have a lot of super and a lot of people all wanting to keep money in our borders and there's not enough good investments. It's really important to remember, though, that that's the weight of money argument. And it's really important to remember that the weight of money, I mean, this idea that 9% of everyone's salary goes into super and then it eventually finds its way into the stock market and therefore the stock market can't help but go up. You know, it's the same thing in the property market. When people said to me two years ago, Rod, you don't appreciate people are migrating to Australia, our population is growing and therefore property prices will always go up. Well, guess what? The population of the world has been growing for centuries and property prices still go down from time to time. So, you know, the weight of money argument doesn't prevent declines in asset prices, and I think it's not going to this time either. Just, just quickly, we'll, we'll talk about Australia and we'll dive into all that in just a second. But on Europe, 
you know, they've already had negative interest rates. What do you think happens next there versus the US, who are the real canary in the coal mine? If the Fed have to go negative, I think a lot of people wake up and say, hold on, this experiment's not working out the way we thought it did. Yeah, look, I think each time uh, a QE, you know, quantitative easing as attempt to run conventional monetary policy is extended, uh, I think the merit of, the merit of that approach uh, is is increasingly doubtful uh, and the market sees it that way you know more and more uh, the market will will discount the prospect of the effectiveness of those measures uh, and so they become less effective you know you're seeing it in china at the moment you know china stimulated again in january uh, and uh, yes it stimulated the economy but not nearly to the extent that the market anticipated and not even as much as the last two so you know it happens from time and time again measures become less effective and ultimately people just start to say, you know what, I'm going to pull my head in. This is at an individual level. I'm going to pull my head in. I'm not going to spend as much money. That starts to feed on itself. Uh, and um, it doesn't matter what levers are pulled, no matter how sharp or blunt they are, people just say, you know what, I've got enough debt. I'm just not going to invest anymore. I'm not going to spend anymore. Whenever I hear that, it reminds me of the um, the oil analogy, the number of barrels of oil you need to find a barrel of oil and you know back in the old days you put a pick in the ground and you hit oil and and then these days you have a hundred barrels of oil worth of digging and you find one barrel of oil and people celebrate it's a bit like that with the debt isn't it you pump a hundred yeah. trillion dollars into maybe get a trillion dollars of growth yeah the marginal return is lower That's exactly it. Exactly. So let's dive into Australia. So we actually did something different in the GFC and we gave out money to everyday people, which was something that hasn't really happened elsewhere. So do you think, helicopter money, do you think if Australia has a downturn, we are going to take a slightly different direction than the US and Europe and do those sort of things again? And where do you see the Australian economy at present? Okay, so so let me just uh, correct one misperception um, yes, there was a bit of helicopter money um, during the US financial crisis, uh, or what we call the global financial crisis. But you might remember there was also the Pink Bats program, and there was also the School Building Revolution program. Yes. Uh, and you know, I was on a building committee for one of the for my son's primary school, my kid's primary school, uh, and you know, we were building classrooms, uh, and uh, we were building classrooms at the rate of six thousand dollars per square meter, which is what you get a luxury house built for these days you know we were doing that then so a lot of money found its way into the construction industry which is the third largest employer uh, in the country healthcare being the first largest or the largest and uh, retail being the second largest so that then had a positive feedback loop um, uh, back into retail which obviously kept us out of recession and remember our banks weren't going broke and weren't being nationalized either our banks were still making billions of dollars uh, although their share prices fell as though they were going out of business, they weren't going out of business. So that's the first thing. Now, today, what we've got is the opposite uh, circumstance. We've got a construction industry that's about to fall on its knees. Uh, why is that? Well, we what we know is that we've already seen a very large drop in building approvals. So building approvals nationally have fallen from about 280,000 dwellings to about 170,000 dwellings. Now, that approvals lead you think about if you're going to build a house the first thing you do is you, you seek approval you get approval from council and then you build so there's a delay between approvals and construction so we now know that there's a significant drop in approvals that will lead to a significant drop in construction in fact just before we've been speaking tonight i had a phone conversation with one of the largest builders in australia a privately owned residential construction company and i spoke to one of the owners uh, and he told me that they're still going well because they're still building and completing uh, orders that were received 12 and 24 months ago. Yeah. But the pipeline is down 50%. So they were selling about 100 or 120 dwellings a month a year ago and two years ago. That's now dropped to 50 to 60 dwellings a month. Um, so they're going to see a literal cliff uh, in the space between now and Christmas. Uh, and that means, and they don't want to do it, but if it, nothing happens, if there's no macro prudential measures by the financial account, sorry, the Council of Financial Regulators being APRA and, and the RBA and so on, if nothing happens um, and rates aren't cut, then there's a big problem. And I suspect the reason why rates weren't cut today is because the RBA 
thinks that a rate cut won't be effective. In fact, this particular builder told me it makes no difference whether rates are 3.9% or 2.9%, people can't get access to money. Yeah. So that 7.25% stressed uh, lending criteria or stressed lending rate, uh, which is imposed by APRA on the banks, and, and they assess a loan based on whether or not the individual can pay back uh, the interest at 7.25%, that needs to be cut. And that's what the Council of Financial Regulators are now discussing, whether or not that gets cut. And mm. I think it be. if it isn't, then we will have a disaster on our hands in the construction industry. And of course, remembering that's the second largest employer, you'll have a lot of tradies out of work. A year ago, tradies could name, brickies could name their terms. Mm. Um, they were being paid $1.80 uh, a brick. Uh, that has dropped 20% to $1.40 a brick today. And this particular builder couldn't get a bricklayer 12 months ago and they were naming their terms. And today they are being inundated with requests for work that they don't have. Yeah, I have a friend in Sydney that works in financial services as well. And he said the scary thing for him is when everyone was blaming the banks, but his boots on the ground are telling him that people aren't even coming in to get credit at all. So it's a supply and a demand thing. So who knows if a few rate cuts are even going to make a, a difference, as you say. Well, I think the RBA is holding off because it will be more effective if it's if it's associated with changes to macroprudential measures. Yeah. And I'll tell you that all the banks are loosening their credit now they're starting to lend more they want to lend more they're loosening their standards a little bit mm. they went too hard after the after the royal commission and they can now relax that a little bit and i think you'll start to see that uh that to, you'll start to see that work through however it will only be effective if it's combined with changes to lending restrictions such as APRA 7.25 percent rate uh, and also the rba cutting now i don't think the banks will pass on those full cuts by the way I agree. I agree with you on that one. I think you touched on this before, but apartment approvals were the stat that I read that have dropped 50% from their heights as well. So do you think this is very much worse for apartments in Sydney and Melbourne, or do you think that they just simply make up too much of our housing and our construction and flow on into the economy that this is going to be fairly widespread? So you, you've, you know, you, you've previously um, talked about the bearish headlines for property. I'm responsible for writing those headlines for the last three years. Yes. Australian, in Money Magazine, and you name it, you know, in Sutton and the Herald Sun. Um, the, 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 now we're at the point where I think the worst of it is done uh, in property. And, you know, we might get another 5 or 10% decline. There are individual suburbs that have declined more. Mm. You know, Southwest Sydney is a disaster zone. You know, um, you look at the Hunter Valley, though, and it's, it's okay. Um, you look at uh, you look at Vaucluse. Prices are still going up. They haven't gone down at all. Tasmania, yeah, yeah. You know, and you look at other other places in Sydney, and prices have fallen thirty percent. So you know, it, it, you know, it's hard to talk in generalities without respecting the fact you've got to respect the fact that there are individual uh, suburbs that are doing better than others, and others that are doing worse. And we also have to remember, while it might be negative for people who've overgeared themselves to buy too many properties at the peak, it's great for people who haven't bought yet. Yeah. So there's a positive flip side to all of this. And now is a better time to buy for people who haven't bought, provided, of course, they can get the credit and that's what's needed. What I think we end up with is we, we end up with a, a grind higher. We end up with a sort of a flat, long bottom rather than a V-shaped bottom. We don't get a sharp recovery in property prices. We end up with some sort of a slow grind higher. I agree. Is that, but is this a two-year grind or like a 10-year Japan yeah, that, style sideways? That's asking me to be too precise. I can't be that precise. Okay. Okay. I think it's going to take some time. There's a lot of debt out there. Other than that, do you think the economy has some, some bright spots that are going to come out of this? Or is it really going to highlight that we haven't got enough you know, government support for startups and technology and healthcare and we need to focus on other industries? Yeah, look out. Look, that's sort of alluding to sort of what the fundamental issue is for Australia, and I've talked to you know the front bench of the government on this particular subject, uh, and I know that at the moment they're not interested. Um, so I say it, you know, I say it to you, but they're not interested in this particular thing. Um, the issue that we've got in Australia is 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 a, is a is a wealth issue as a nation, uh, and that stems from the fact that we uh, pay more for our imports than we earn on our exports. Uh, so fundamentally, if we have a current account deficit and we continue to spend more on our imports, 
than we earn on our exports. And to put it in perspective, we have to export six or seven tonnes of iron ore to afford one iPhone, right? And, and that just can't go on forever. So what we need to do fundamentally is we need to add value to our exports. Why? Because if we have a current account deficit, which is what we've got at the moment, if we have a current account deficit, we need to have a capital account surplus. How do you get a capital account surplus? You have to attract foreign investment. And you do that two ways. You either borrow money or you sell your assets. So it's a little bit like my son selling his bedroom in order to be able to afford to buy a PS4. You know, and that's what we're doing as a nation. We're selling our businesses. We're selling our farmland. We're selling our, our arable land. You know, apparently 14% of arable land in Victoria is actually owned by you know, the largest Asian nation. Um, uh, you know, I don't know whether that's exactly right, but I, I've read that number. Uh, and uh, you know, it's very hard to actually work out if that's the right number, obviously. Uh, but it's about that, according to experts. So can we keep doing that? We, we can't keep doing it. So what's the solution? Well, one possible solution is acknowledging that the government is not very good at picking winners in industries. Um, so let the market do it. The market is very good at picking winners. It allocates, unless interest rates are too low for too long, right? And then you get a misallocation of resources. Yeah. Uh, but... But normally, the, the, the capitalist system does a good job of allocating resources to things that are going to be successful and make money. Acknowledging that, what you do is you actually simply say, you know what, if you're a startup, a genuine startup, and you're a startup that's going to add value to our exports, we'll give you a tax break. You pay no tax on your profits for the, I'm just making up the numbers here. So the first $300,000 profit that you make is tax free for the first three years go and start a business that's going to add value to our exports and you'll get that tax holiday. And suddenly what will happen is the economy will start working out what we're good at value, value adding and, it will, and the market will rise up an industry that can employ lots of people to actually achieve that. And then the government can come in over the top and subsidise it and grow it even faster and stimulate it even more. But there doesn't seem to be any interest in politics at the moment in the government to actually do anything like that. You could actually combine it with a um, you know a trade for a, a trade free zone a free trade zone, so you could say I don't know Geelong in Victoria or Wollongong or Newcastle in New South Wales, and you could say if you start up that business in those regions, there are other advantages as well. And guess what? People would migrate to those areas. That would alleviate some of the pressure that we've got on infrastructure in the major cities. Universities, people would start, you know, wanting to go to universities in those towns. They would graduate and get jobs in those towns. And, you know, we'd be nation building again. No interest at the moment. Why? I think it's because we've got a three-year uh, three year um, uh, cycle uh, for the federal government. We have four years uh, in state. Um, we've inherited the Westminster system, but in the UK it's five years. For some reason, three years... The government doesn't think that it's going to get the benefit. It's going to get credit for doing anything like that. And so it doesn't happen. It's crazy the number of startups I've spoken to that, yeah, would employ more people, but instead they're moving to Southeast Asia and just anywhere else apart from Australia because of all the, the current conditions. Well, those startup, those startup incentives that I talked about, they exist in Israel. They exist in Singapore. They exist in London. They exist in the United States in some states. Uh, it exists elsewhere and it works. For some reason, we just don't do it keep shipping dirt and importing iPhones. So for people that are a bit worried about the economy or whatnot, Roger, I know you said there's going to be some opportunities coming ahead and I'm, I'm not a bear. That was something that I learned early on in my journey, thanks to people like you, is there's no point watching these doom sales on the internet because there's always a good time to buy an asset and a good time to sell it. So well, is, is it, can I just, if you don't mind, I'll refine that a little bit. There's not always a good time, but there's always a good price. And you know, sometimes you have to wait for that price, but there is a good price. Yes, you're right. I just I, my, my point is that a lot of people come to me and say, everything's going to crash. What do I do? And I, I don't like people to be that pessimistic. No, and, and look, the reality is there's, no, there's no, nothing wrong with keeping some money aside for that rainy day. Um, but in the meantime, you miss out on a lot of growth and a lot of gains by not being invested. Um, yes, you can boost your returns by taking advantage of that. So it's always important to have some cash on the side. Uh, but I can tell you from personal and painful experience, not being invested, you, you're better off being in a business. You, you look at the, you know, the old BRW, the Business Review Weekly, Rich 200, you won't find anyone in there who became a billionaire by sitting on cash. Yeah. You know, they invested in a business. Uh, and so business is the best place to be uh, if you want to generate returns that are going to maintain or grow your purchasing power over time. 
Um, and, you know, I think overall, long term, you're better off in business than anywhere else. But it's good to keep some options open to buy things cheap if and when they're delivered. And Roger, we very much uh, respect different opinions on the channel. And I know you're not a bull on gold and Bitcoin and so on. So do you want to talk about your thoughts on all of that? Yeah, look, look, there are periods where gold goes up, you know, and then it comes back down again. Um, the problem I've got with gold is that in 100 years time, if you went and bought, you know, 20 kilos of gold, what can you do with it today? You know, there's not much you can do with it. There's very little industrial use for that particular metal. And you can look at it. You know, I think Warren Buffett once said you could you could fondle it, you know, but that's about it. You can't do anything with it. And in 100 years' time, that's still all you'll be able to do with it. Um, but if you'd put that money into, you know, arable land or you put that money into commercial real estate or industrial real estate or into businesses, uh, you know, even commodity businesses, you know, like Exxon Mobil or whatever, you know, they will be producing more of the product that they produce um, and the value of their reserves will be much, much higher in the future than they are today, um, whatever they are. So, you know, you'll be better off in businesses and in real estate than you'll be in gold over that period of time. Now, that's not to say that you won't make money speculating on the price going up now and then. But in the long run, you know, now I'm talking over a lifetime, you're probably better off in other asset classes. Yeah, and, and as far as Bitcoin goes, I know it's a, it's... A... Bitcoin is very different to someone in Venezuela than in Australia, for example. But do you have any thoughts on Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies? I think, I think you know, distributed ledgers on which you know current cryptocurrencies are based. I think, I think it's a shame that distributed ledgers, um, uh, you know, were <clears throat> hijacked uh, by uh, currencies. You know, current Bitcoin is a means by which we um, pay people to maintain the distributed ledger, right? That, that's all it is. The, the idea of a non-centralized banking system or a non-centralized share registry, you know, that has appeal. Um, and, you know, that's what I think, you know, that's what I think distributed ledgers are ultimately. I think, you know, they're a fantastic idea. But how do you incentivize people to maintain them, right? You sitting at home or, or me sitting in the office, if I'm going to sit here and maintain this distributed ledger and I'm going to maintain all the transactions that occur. Uh, I need to be incentivized to do that. So the way they came up with doing that was to give you a, a you know, a little chip yeah. that said, you know, this might be worth something one day. Here's how I'm going to incentivize you. People started to speculate on that, and then the focus was lost. Um, so you know, I think I think the idea is a good one, and I think the cryptocurrencies probably, you know, probably um, hijacked what was a good idea. So we'll get. We'll get, you know, cryptocurrency 2.0 or 3.0 or 5.0 down the track and it'll be a be better version than what we've seen in the past. We're already there, Roger, with uh, projects claiming that they're 5.0 and whatnot. But do, do you have any thoughts on fidelity and... and, and... It's crash completely and all these things need to go away and be forgotten about for, you know, for 10 years and then they come back with a better version. That's historic history shows that's what happens with these things. For sure, for sure. So there's a lot of noise at the moment about fidelity and all these big Wall Street players opening up Bitcoin investment vehicles and whatnot. You'll be avoiding that just like you are with 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 gold and a lot of commodities. Yeah, you can't you can't put a dress on a pig and you know call it a ballerina. Um, you know, it's still a pig. <laughs> that's going to upset a lot of our followers, Roger. But I have thoroughly enjoyed this interview, and um, thanks. <laughs> wrong you know let me say that you know I've, I've been wrong before and i could be wrong again and that's fine um but i think i think you know it is speculation um it's not investing and as long as you understand the difference you'll allocate an appropriate amount of capital to it and then you're not going to you're not going to bet the farm on it uh, and then you'll do just fine yes we are all about well-rounded investing education and we're certainly not encouraging anyone to put large percentages into bitcoin so thanks for your time today roger we'll definitely have to have you back on again in the future Okay, look forward to it. Thanks, guys.